Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Awesome. We should all be doing great because we were woken this morning. Oh, yes. Children's Church, if you are a part of Children's Church, you are dismissed now. Whoops. Y'all just give me one second here. I learned long ago to have multiple sources because I did this once and I actually threw my notes off of the podium and it was pretty interesting for the rest of the sermon. (laughs) But uh, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here with y'all. I'm filling in for Pastor Kevin today. Um, I think most of us know each other. My name is Albert Diaz, Uh, my wife Emily here, and actually my mom is with me as well. I'm a member here at San, at, I was about to say, I'm a member here at the San Antonio Baptist Association. No, I'm a member here at Stonebridge, and I work for the San Antonio Baptist Association um, with uh, Daryl Horn and a couple of the others who have been up here before. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here. This is an honor, and this is a huge blessing. Just to be able to go and visit congregations and share with them is a huge blessing, but an even bigger blessing is when we get to do it with our home church and our home church family. This is just cool for me. So uh, let's go ahead and begin. begin. We're going to be in the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel, today, chapters 11 and 12. We're going to open up with a word of prayer. But as we open up with a word of prayer, go ahead and start finding that with your, in your Bibles. We're going to move pretty rapidly. Uh, we're going to read through a section, but we need to read through that section in order to get context for the rest of the message. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for all the blessings you give us day after day, Lord. Father, we just thank you for uh, everybody that is gathered here today, Lord. We thank you for, uh, for, the, for Pastor Kevin, Lord, and his family, Lord, and just pray that you would watch over them, protect them as they, uh, they make their way back this week, Lord. And we just uh, we continually thank you, Lord, for, for calling him, Lord, and for bringing him here to this congregation. Father, we thank you for everybody that is gathered here. Thank you for everyone who is watching online and just for those who couldn't make it this morning, Lord. I pray uh, for those who are sick. I pray for those who are hurting and for those who just need to hear from you or feel you today. Father, uh, pray that we, uh, we have a good morning. We pray this on Jesus' name. Amen. So let's open our Bibles. We're going to start in 2 Samuel 11, 1, and we're going to read through this story. I'm not going to read the entire chapter uh, because I don't want us to be here till 4 o'clock. But what we are going to do is we're going to read a couple of verses through it, and we're going to go through what is happening here in this story. And I'll stay away from that monitor. So 2 Samuel 11, 1. Then it happened in the spring at the time when the kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they brought destruction on the son of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. So let's look at this first verse already. Because this first verse is already going to give us a little bit of context as to what our message is going to be. It is springtime, so the men have gone out to fight. The kings of, of the different provinces of Judea have gone out to fight. It's springtime. There's food. Food's plentiful. It's warmer, so it, it's fighting season. David is uh, considered a warrior king. David is the, the king that is supposed to lead the army. He's a warrior king. He's like, uh, like Charlemagne, like Richard the Lionheart, like Ragnar Lothbrook, like all these other warrior kings that you hear about throughout history. They led their armies. They fought with their armies. They were on the field with their armies. Ulysses S. Grant wasn't a king, but he was a general, fought with his army. Where's David? David's not with his army. The men have gone out to fight, and David decided to stay home. Gentlemen, bad things happen to us when we are not where we're supposed to be. Bad things happen to us when we... Don't do what we're supposed to do. We're going to see how this is going to escalate, and we're going to see how this translates directly and correlates directly with today's society and how the problems of here are just the same problems that we have today. So while his men are out fighting, they're dying, they're expanding the kingdom of Judea, and David, who is also known as the man after God's own heart, what is he doing? First of all, he's not with his men. He's not with the army. He's at home. He's in his palace. He's walking around. So he's out one night stargazing. We'll say say he's stargazing. He's walking around the roof of his home. And um, first of all, he shouldn't be on the roof of his home. He should be with his men. 
what does he do? First of all, the first mistake was not doing what he's supposed to do. Second mistake, now he's walking around with idle hands, and he begins to look around. He looks down, and on the rooftop below his roof, he sees a woman bathing. So being the, a good, godly man, he turns away and, and runs from it. No, he doesn't. He stays looks, and he looks longer, and he looks more and more and more. And he finally gets to the point where he's tired of looking, and he needs to act. So what does he do? He sends his servants. He says, go down there and uh, bring that woman to me. And the servants, do, and when you read this, one thing I am going to encourage you to do, since we're not going to read all of chapter 11, please read it up for yourselves. Read this chapter. And I, and I encourage that for, for any sermon or any lesson, Bible study. After you've gone through the study, go back and read it for, on your own. God reveals a whole lot of little things to us that he may not reveal at the time, but he'll reveal to us later in person. And, and when it's personal, just with him. So, the thing is, this woman, her name is Bathsheba. She has a husband. The servants know that. As you read the chapter, you're going to hear it. And they say, isn't this Bathsheba? Her husband's name is Uriah. He's a Hittite. He's also a soldier. He is out fighting with the kings. He's out where David's supposed to be. So, Here's David. He is now, he's lusting after this woman. He sends for her. He ends up having sex with her, and then he sends her home, thinking nothing is wrong. But David knows in his mind, even being a king, you cannot commit adultery. He still knows that if this gets out, I'm going to be in trouble. It doesn't matter if you're king or not. It doesn't matter who you are. That's a law that was blanket for everyone. So she has a husband. David knows she has a husband. David knows who her husband is. He's fighting with his men. Things happen. The woman ends up pregnant. So she sends word back to David, I'm pregnant. David begins to panic because her husband's been out fighting. There's no way that he got her pregnant. Something has to give here. He concocts a plan because, you know, guys, we're good at making plans and we're good at fixing things. We love to fix things. The problem is when we fix things on our own accord, we normally just break them more than they already are. And we end up making the situation worse because we did it on our own accord and not on the accord of the Lord. And not in, gui and not in the Lord's guidance, but on our own accord and our own guidance. So what happens? David comes up with a plan. He says, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this thing up where I need a report from the field. So I want Uriah to bring back a report, and then I'll report to him, and I'll report back to the generals over there. Okay, so he brings Uriah with him, plays nice with Uriah, knowing the whole time that he's trying to deceive him, has dinner with him, and then sends him home. It says, Uriah, go home. Go be with your wife. Uriah responds very specifically, and if you'll look at 2 Samuel 11, 11, this is Uriah's response. And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and, my, and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Should I then go to my house, eat and drink and sleep with my wife? By your life and by the life of your soul, I will not do this. Uriah's got character. Uriah is not willing to go into his house and sleep in his comfortable bed when his compatriots are out sleeping in a field, in the open fields, in tents. He says, I'm not going to do it by your life. Nothing you could tell me, king, is going to make me go and be with my wife and be in my home. So David concocts a second plan. He says, well, I know what we'll do. Let's just try this again. Let's try a 2.0. I'll bring some alcohol into the mix. So David once again wines and dines Uriah. This time he gets him drunk. And he expects him, now this drunken man's going to go home. Well, the next morning, David finds out that he didn't go home. He once again slept outside of the palace. David is now angry. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this situation the way I think David would have approached it. I would have been angry at Uriah for not listening to me. Because I'm the king, and I told you to go do something, and you didn't do it. It's your fault, Uriah. You drove me to have to do this. So what does David do? He pens a letter. He pens a letter to Joab, to the commanding officer there. And he says um, in the letter, 
He gives it to Uriah. He tells Uriah, go deliver this message. It's a sealed message. It's a royal message. Uriah's not going to open it. He doesn't know what's in it. Inside this message is a note. The note is, according to 2 Samuel eleven fifteen. 15, he had written in the letter the following, station Uriah at the front line of the fiercest battle and pull back from him so that he may be struck down and killed. So the plan works. Uriah moves forward. The men pull back. He's struck down. He's dead. Problem solved. And we're good. Because now Bathsheba's a widow. David can marry a widow. She has a time of mourning. Then after that, she's free. David's plan has worked. Nobody knows. Nobody's the wiser. So what happens? Verse 26. Now when Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent servants and had her brought to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But the thing is that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. So he got away with it, and all of the people around him, nobody's the wiser, but guess what? The Lord saw it. And this was evil in the sight of the Lord. What happens? As we look at chapter 12, we're going to see the response from the Lord. And I think this is a response that I, I said this last night. You know, many times when, when somebody preaches a message, it's not because it came in some divine revelation. It's because it came as a brick being hurled at their head. And conviction hurts sometimes. And being called out by the Lord hurts sometimes. And that's exactly what, what happened and what brought, what brought this message. So we read in 2 Samuel 12, as we go on to the next chapter, the Lord's going to do something here. He's going to do something very important. The Lord's going to send a messenger. He's going to send a man, a prophet named Nathan. Now, Nathan is my hero. And, and by me reading this out and by me talking to you, I'm no Nathan. I'm on the David side. So I want you all to know that right now. Because first of all, Nathan has the courage to go stand before King David and say something that I don't know if I would, even if I knew that the Lord wanted me to do it. So what happens? Chapter 12, the Lord then sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, there were two men in the city, one rich, one poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And he grew up together with him and his children, and they would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the way for her who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had came to him. David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Mind you, at this point of history, David acting as a king is also a judge. He's also the judge. So they would have brought cases to him. He would have heard cases and acted as a judge. So here, David is responding to this as a judge. He is saying, man, this happened in my kingdom. This man deserves to die. He did this with no compassion. How could he have his own flocks and flocks and take this one man's one ewe lamb? That's wrong. That guy deserves to die, says David. The surprising thing is that a lot of times we're better at giving advice than taking our own advice. Because if David had thought about that closely, he would have known what, Nathan, what exactly Nathan was saying. And he would have known why Nathan sent them, because he would have known Nathan to be a prophet. Nathan then says to David, you are the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your care. I gave you the house of Israel, the house of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like this. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the, son, with the sword of the sons of Ammon. He just called David out. This is David who killed the lion. This is David who, like I said last night, literally brought the rock to the sword fight and won. 
This is King David. This is the man that with a gesture could have had him executed. But he comes up and he provides this, this revelation to David. Why? Why, why is that important for us today? Gentlemen, we are the man. I definitely don't mean that the way society says you're the man. We are the man. You know what? The Lord has given us our homes. He's given us our employment. He's given us our family. He's promised to give us so much more, but we don't take advantage of it. The Lord has promised all these things to us. Why don't we fulfill it? Why don't we have it if he's promised all these things? And if he's given us all these things, our employment, our cars, our homes, the roof over our head, everything that we have was given to us by the Lord. So why don't we do that? I'm going to read something for you all. Several years back, the Washington Area, of Co- the Washington Area Coalition of Men's Ministries, WACM, did a, a report inside Washington State, and they wanted to find out the state of the men in Washington State. That, that was a lot of states. The state of the men in Washington State. It was pretty dismal. These were Christian men. These were men that proclaimed to be a Christian. They were polled, and they found some very, very dismal results. So they said, surely, surely this cannot be the state of the men in this country. So what did they do? They applied for some grants. They commissioned a a nationwide multi-year survey to be done of professing Christian men. They worked with Pew Research, uh, Lifeway Family Research Center, and uh, Barna Group. This is what they came up with. On average, for every 10 professing Christian men in the American church, I'm talking about the evangelical church, nine will have children who leave the church. Eight are not satisfied with their jobs. Six are paying the minimum on their monthly credit card bills. Five look at pornography. Four will be divorced. And one will have a biblical view and see life through God's word. 25% of Christian men say they are not satisfied with themselves as fathers. 53% of Christian men admit to fantasizing about other women. 54% of Christian men feel shame about past relationships and experiences. 62% of men say they are not satisfied with their marriage. That's miserable. Men, why are we so miserable? Why such miserable results? Perhaps we're so miserable and so unhappy because God is unhappy with us. That's dismal. That's heartbreaking. These are Christian men. The sad part is, when you put this poll of Christian men next to a secular poll, the numbers are almost identical. That means there's no difference. Where's the transformation, guys? And I'm not talking about any person in particular. I'm talking about the men in the American church in general, in his church, in the Lord's church. Why are we so miserable? Perhaps this has something to do with it. In 1997, according to Pew Research, 42% in the U.S. attended church regularly. In 2007, the number of men attending church regularly dropped to 28. Ten years, 42 to 28%. In 2007, 65% of men believed that God was true and were absolutely certain of his existence. 19 believed that God existed and were fairly certain of his existence. In 2014, 10 years later, that 65 number dropped to 57, and the 19 number grew to 21. That means less men believed that God was real, and less men believed that God was not only real but absolute. And infinite. So that was seven years ago. The results for 21 will be out soon. In early 22. I wonder what numbers those are going to say. And I'll get back to you with that because that's not too far from now. Again, it's dismal. David's father, Solomon, arguably the wisest man on the planet, prayed for one thing, and the Lord said, I'll give it to you in abundance, wisdom. The book of Proverbs, Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You know what that means, guys? That means that we can't sharpen ourselves. 
That means you could have the sharpest knife right out of the box, but if you don't sharpen it and if it's not honed and if it's not taken care of, it'll get dull and then it becomes useless. Then it becomes stat. And then we just become statistics. What do you need to sharpen a knife? You need, you need something else. You need a honing block. You need another knife. Did you know even if you get two knives and rub them against each other, they'll sharpen each other? You could do that if you ever need to put a, a quick edge on your ax. You could use a knife. That's bad. Gentlemen, if you do not have a prayer buddy, if you do not have a prayer group, if you do not have of men around you that you can call when you're in trouble, you can call when you're, when you're hurting, when you're feeling, you call you and say, hey, man, I'm in trouble. I need some help. I'm about to mess up. Or I just messed up. And I'm not talking about the friend that is going to say, hey, well, let's go think about that. Um, you know what? Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about it over a couple of beers. That's not the friend I'm talking about. I'm talking about the friend that's going to come over to your house, open up a Bible, and say, hey, let's pray together, brother. I'm talking about the guy you can call 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning because you think your marriage is falling apart. I'm talking about the guy that you can call when your kids have pushed you to the, the last straw. And you're at that point that the decision you make next is going to affect you. And it's not only going to affect you, but it's going to affect your family. We need that, gentlemen. If we don't have that, we're lost. We become dull knives. What good is a dull knife? Not much. You don't cut with a dull knife because it's easier to cut yourself. Did y'all know that? It's easier to cut yourself with a dull knife than it is a sharp knife. Because you have to put so much force into making a cut when it should just slice right through whatever the media is. Something powerful happens when men get together and become what God intended them to be. Transformation happens. When men take on leadership roles in spiritual things, something powerful happens. Did you know, this is according to Barna Group 2016 research, that if a child is the first to attend church, 3.5% of the time their families will follow. If the wife or mother is the first to attend church, it's 17% of the time the family will follow. When a husband or father begins to attend church regularly, 93% of the time the family follows. Why? Because God designed it that way. It's not a men are better than women thing. It's that God designed it that way. God placed us as the heads of our household. And you know what we did? We didn't drop the ball. Because if we dropped the ball, then that would mean that we ran from the fight. We didn't drop it. We knew the game had to be played. We lateraled it. We said, here, wife, you take the ball. Sister, mother, you lead for me. I'm going to stand back. You need something built? I'll build the stage for you. but I'm not going to help with the kids. I'll bring my tools. I'll drill that for you. I'll cut that for you. I'll build it for you. But, oh, lead a Bible study? I don't know about that one. Can I just change the exhaust on your car first? Because we like to fix things. Thing is, guys, sometimes we need to fix ourselves. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. When was the last time you were sharpened? When was the last time that you had a godly conversation with another brother in Christ? When was the last time you got on your knees and begged for forgiveness? When was the last time? When was the last time that we looked and said, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? As your priest, as a head of my household, but a part of your body, a part of your church, what is it that you want me to do, Lord? It's not a coincidence. It's not rocket science. You don't have to be a physicist. You don't have to be an engineer to, to realize this. 
God's a God of design. He's a designer. He's a God of order. Everything in the universe has order. That's why apologetics is so easy because there's so much order in the universe. There's so much order in biology. There's so much order that the designer is, is evident throughout it. That's why it's so easy to prove God because he's everywhere in everything. There's also order to what he expects of us. We gave it. We passed the responsibility. We've passed it on to our wives, our mothers, our sisters, and we've had them lead. Gentlemen, we have despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight. May not be the same sin David committed. It might be. I don't know. I don't know your stories. You don't know mine. And that's why I'm saying we. There's no you in this. This is us. This is Christian men in general. We need to help each other out. We need to be brothers. Because without that, we're just single strands. And we're not gonna do, we're not gonna go very far on our own. There's no way we're ever gonna reach our full potential on our own accord. You just can't do it. There is no way. We could try and we could try and we can fight it and we can fight it, but we'll never be satisfied. We're never gonna have the nice, the nice enough house. We're never going to have the newest car. We're never going to have the fastest car, the, the highest pickup truck. We're never going to have whatever it is that we want. We're never going to have enough money. If you're unhappy with what you're making, I guarantee you, we could add $100,000 to your salary instantly, and at the end of the year, you're still going to be unhappy because money's not the fix. The fix is in here. Some of the, the places that I've had the honor, the blessing to go to, and I meet these people that, you know, at times don't even have the shoes on feet, on their feet. But they're happy and they're content. And they'll offer you every, what little bit they have, they'll offer it to you. Here, just take it. And they're happy. Why are we so unhappy? Compare our, our lives to the lives of most of the people on this planet. We have it pretty good in this country. We're able to come here and meet this morning. I have no fear that somebody's going to kick down that front door and arrest us all. That's not going to happen. We have it pretty good. I think we have it too good at times. Because we haven't had to be sharpened. Why? Because we haven't had to be used for a task. We've been put away in a drawer, and we're sitting there dull. It's time to pull each other out. Time to get out the honing stone, and it's time to do some sharpening. Otherwise, we will never move forward. I'm not talking about Stonebridge Baptist Church. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about all churches. And the reason I'm talking about all churches is because 4,470 Southern Baptist churches closed last year. And that's the average. That's not, that's not a COVID number. That's average. It's been that number for years. We plan about 1,500 churches throughout the United States, Southern Baptist churches. In the evangelical church, the number is over 7,800. I looked that up last night. 7,800 congregations closing every year. We're currently looking for 32 pastors for pastorless churches in this city. And that's just us. That's just, that's just the Baptists. I'm not talking about the Assemblies of God. I'm not talking about the Presbyterians, the Methodists, everyone else. But it's the same. Because I talk with them and meet with them regularly. It's bad, guys. What are we going to do? I think we're at a point where there's only one thing that we can do. Because we're going to continue praying for a revival. We always pray for revival. We need revival, Lord. We're going to pray for awakening because we need awakening. People need to hear from you, Lord. The thing is, 
You can't revive something that never lived. I hate to say it. If something never lived, you can't revive it. You can't resuscitate something that's never had life. It doesn't happen. You can't take a rock and give it life. At least not with human hands. What happens? What needs to happen? It has to begin in us. Perhaps there was life there. It burned. Remember when you first accepted the Lord and you wanted to tell everybody about it and you're running up and down and your friends are telling you, dude, just be quiet. Parents are mad at you because you're, you're the first one that's a Christian and now you're praying for 10 minutes in the beginning of the meal and they just want to eat. Little things like that. Unless we have what a good friend of mine, George Ramirez, calls the me vival. I didn't give him credit for this last night, but he calls it the me vival. Me vival. Unless there's a revival inside of me, there will never be a revival inside of the church. Why? Because it takes individuals. It takes individuals to start the spark and to get it going. And then as others fill in, that's the fuel. But there has to be a catalyst. Something has to hit the striker. That's the Mevival. You know what happens with Mevival? From Mevival comes Revival. Why? Because I caught it. And I'm going to tell my buddy about it. And he's going to tell his buddy about it. And together, we're going to start telling everybody else about it. And you know what happens then, guys? Gentlemen? That's called awakening. That means that the church is so alive and so on fire that it busts out of the walls and it begins to trickle out and bleed into the neighborhood surrounding it. That's awakening. Like I said, we pray for revival. We pray for awakening. Do we really know what it is, though? You can't have an awakening without revival. You will never have revival without a self-awakening. Gentlemen, we need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to God. If we need to, if we need to start at Genesis 1-1, then that's what we have to do. But I'll tell you what, I'll walk with it with you. We can walk it together. Every step of the way, I'll walk with you. Together, we can, we can be a force to be reckoned with. We could be a force that no darkness would ever even dare mess with. Because the power of the Lord would be shining so brightly. And I guarantee you, from that, ladies, your families will be better. And you're not going to have to wear 10 hats here at the church. Because that's the other thing we do. We need volunteers. We need help. All we do is add hats to people. By hats, I mean responsibilities and tasks. Well, we know you have this job, but we're just going to give you another one. But you only do that on Sunday, so we're going to give you a Wednesday task. You only do that on Wednesdays. We're going to give you a Sunday morning task. The first half of Sunday morning, the second half of Sunday morning. Where are volunteers? Why don't we have enough people to fill the spots? Maybe we didn't know there was a need there. Or maybe we knew there was a need there and just kind of didn't want to know. Either way, I'm telling you, what y'all are, are feeling right now, how do you think I felt two weeks ago when the Lord hit me with this? It was hard. And I, I, was, I was reading a report that I had just gotten an email from Barn, and it was on the state of men in the church. And it popped up in an email, and I clicked on it, and I started reading it, and all of a sudden, I started getting hit by bricks. And they were directed directly at me because I realized everything that I wasn't doing correctly and everything that I need to work on. So we're in it together. Sisters, ladies, dear sisters, please, I am not saying do not take this as the fact that women cannot lead in church. We know they can, and we know they, they do it. What I am saying is that God is a God of order, and we have plenty of men in the American church that need to step up and can take some of these roles, and we can work better. It would be better if there was a husband and wife leading that team than just the wife. We need to start teaching apologetics. 
Please teach that to our children. I'm an advocate of teaching apologetics for the first grade and up. They need to know how to defend their faith. They need to know why they have faith. They need to know to, to give an answer when they're pressed. Otherwise, they're going to clam up. That's why we lose 92% of high schoolers by the second year of college. 87 or 92, somewhere in there. I think the higher number. We need to do something. It's showdown time. We've all been called out. So it's noon, we're sitting here. Kind of bad to say we're sitting in the saloon, but it's high noon. We've been called out. Are you going to go out onto the street? Or are we going to continue passing the bell to our wives and say, here, you go do that fight for me? That's a little too tough for me. We need to step up, gentlemen. We're hurting. And the reason we're hurting is because of us. Who's going to teach our children's children if our children don't know the Lord? Or their children? Who's going to fill these seats after we're all gone? Forty years from now, who's going to be here? Will there still be an expression of the gospel at Stonebridge Baptist Church in 40 years? If Stonebridge Baptist Church was to close right now, would the neighborhood realize it? If XYZ Church was to close right now, would their neighborhood realize it? See, that's not just us. It's, it's everywhere. One of the... Uh, one of the amazing things um, since working at Saba has been to be able to work with these congregations, all different types of congregations, um, roughly about a little bit over 300 of them. But the problems are all the same. We're talking different, different economic statuses, different areas of town, even different languages. But the problems are the same. We just don't have people. We just don't have the people. If 65% of men believe in God, how come we don't have any people? It hits home. The thing is, we, we have time. We're here. We still have the opportunity to turn this around. How do we turn it around? We turn it around by just getting back to the basics. We turn it around by looking at God's design and just doing what he asked us to be. We turn it around by fellowshipping with one, each, with one another. We turn it around by, by sharpening one another. We turn it around by, yes, showing some vulnerability with a close brother. Or a friend. A lot of men I know don't even have friends. They don't have a close friend. Some guy that they could say, oh, yeah, that's my buddy. I can call him anywhere. They have acquaintances. We have tons of acquaintances. But a close friend. A lot of men don't have that. You need that. We have to have that. We're not going to do it on our own. And even with the Lord's help, it's, it's pretty difficult. But if we do it together and with the Lord's guidance, oh, my goodness, we'd be unstoppable. Then you would have revival. Then you would have awakening. Then people begin to come to the Lord. And it's never about numbers. It's about souls. It's about souls. It's never about numbers. I, it doesn't matter to me if there's five or 5,000. It's about the souls. To me, it's not about money either. It's about souls. If you have an event and it costs $5,000 and two people came to know the Lord, that worth is immeasurable to those two people. Two people came to know the Lord, and if they were discipled correctly, and then they brought two people to know the Lord, and then those two people brought two people, and then those two people brought two people, do the math. 
It's exponential. It adds up quickly. We've had 2,000 years to do it, and we haven't gotten it right. But we have the manual, and we have the ability. So let's do it. As we close today, and as we pray, our time of invitation is going to be a personal time. Gents, I want us to, to think. Ladies, I, I, want, I need you all to pray. I need you to, to pray for the men in your family. I need you all to pray for your, for your dads. I need you to pray for your brothers. Pray for, for your uncles, your grandpas. Pray for everybody because we need it. We need your prayers, ladies. We really do. We need your support. We need your prayers. Gents, we need, we need to be the men that God designed us to be. That's a hard question. There's a, there comes a point when we need to put down the games. We need to put away the, oh, let's just have fun, because it's fun time and fun time and fun time. Because I guarantee you we can have as much fun as we want in here, but it's not fun out there. And your kids are not having fun where they're being bombarded left and right from high school to college by everything that is telling them that God does not exist and God is not good and God is evil. So that's the new thing, acknowledging God's existence, but showing how evil he is because of all the evil things that God does, like sickness and evil in the world. And if you don't know how to answer that question, then you're stuck. That's why our children need to know this. So as we pray, I think let's, let's just dig down. Let's dig down deep. And if there's something that we need to give to the Lord, if there's something we need to say, if there's something we need to confess, if there's something we need to do, then let this be the week that we do it. Let this be the day we do it. If there's something we need to give to the Lord and we need to confess and we need to say, Lord, I'm sorry, I messed it up. If there's somebody we need to apologize to, if there's an app we need to download on our phone and block certain websites, yeah, I'm going there. Let's do it. Because if you're doing that, your kids are going to do it too. Can't tell your kids, hey, don't drink, boy. It's bad for you. It doesn't work. Do as I say, not as I do has never worked. It just builds secrets. Because they know that you disapprove and they're, just, they're going to still do it. They're just not going to tell you about it. That's the truth. I know because I'm the living example of that. I'm what you call them, the stubbornest person on the planet. There's no lesson that I ever learned easy. Never. But it's taken a long time to come to realize that I'm a terrible decision maker when it comes to decisions of life. I have to give everything to the Lord now. That's the only way that things work out. I've ruined too many things, broken too many relationships. I can't do it on my own power. It took a lot of hard lessons to learn to give it to God and just let him lead. It doesn't take anything from me. I'm still, I'm still the head of my household. I'm still a man. I'm still tough. I think I am. But I know where I get my direction. I quit giving myself orders. I take them now. So let's pray, Jim. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you just for, for everybody that is gathered here today, Lord, for those who are on Facebook, Lord, those who are here, those who are live streaming. And Lord, I just pray for us. Father God, I, I pray for I pray for the men of, of your church, Lord. And I say your church, Lord, because it is your church. It's not my church. It's not our church. It's your church. We are members. We are parts of your body and of your church. Father, you are the head of your church. We need to receive our direction from you, Lord. Father, we're, uh, we're, we're dropping the ball here. We're, we're passing it. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, Lord. Lord, you sent Nathan to call out to, to call out David, Lord, and you've called us out today. Lord, I just pray for, for everybody that is here. I pray for the, for the men that are gathered here. Lord, I pray for the men across America, across our country. I pray for the men of your church. I pray that we would unite, Lord, that we would stand up biblically, that we would stand up godly, that we would stand up for what's right, 
even if it costs us. I pray that we would, would speak the voice of truth. I pray that we would be examples. I pray that we would be good examples. Lord, I pray that we would lead by doing, not by saying. Father, I pray that we would be disciples. I pray that we would be disciples. I pray for, for those men who, who we need somebody in our lives, Lord, a mentor or something, somebody. I pray that you would provide those people, Lord. I pray just for, for renewal of minds, Lord. I pray for renewal of hearts, Lord. And most of all, Lord, we just pray for wisdom and guidance. Lord, we know that you have this planned out. We know that you are God of order. You're God of design. And this is your design, Lord. We need to fit to your blueprint and quit trying to make our own. Father, I pray, I pray for the, the ladies, the sisters that are gathered here, Lord. I pray that they would join us in prayer. I pray that they would pray for their brothers, their, their fathers, their, their uncles, Lord, and their sons. They would pray that they would be godly men, Lord, that they would seek you first, Lord, that they would seek your wisdom, seek your knowledge, Lord, I pray for them. Father, I pray for, for any man that, that is hearing my voice, that has something that they need to, to, to let go. I pray that they would place it at the foot of your cross, Lord. I pray that they would give it to you. I pray that if they've been struggling with it and they've been struggling with it and struggling with it and they just can't beat it on their own, Lord, that they would ask you for help. I pray that you would take that from them. I pray that you would help. I pray that you would provide courage. I pray that you would provide the right prayer buddies, the right prayer warriors to surround this individual. I pray for my sisters. I pray for, for them. Thank you for them, for their willingness to lead, their willingness to step up, where at times we have fallen back. Father God, thank you for this day. Father God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Because we know that even through all of the reading of this, through all of these, these dismal results, Lord, we know this isn't the end. We know that we still have time. There's still time to change this. We can change this. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take that me Bible. It's going to take the Lord. I need to come to you, Lord. And Lord, I need you. I need you to guide me. Father, I pray specifically for the men here. I pray for my brothers. I pray for my church brothers. I pray that we would... Uh, we would come together. I pray that we would be uh, we would be iron to sharpen each other. I pray that we would be that honing stone to sharpen one another. Father, I just pray for us. I pray for the children. I pray for projects, for for programs, for for classes. Just that we would that we would do it right, Lord. That we would teach them and train them the way that you want us to. To teach them and train to the, to train the next generation. Father, we're coming at this late in the game, but the bell hasn't rung yet. We're still in it. Father, please show your mercy on us. Extend your grace to us. Help us, Lord. Thank you once again for this morning. Thank you for everybody that's gathered here. If there is somebody out there who hears this, just need to give something to the Lord, just do it now. Just place it at his feet. Place it at the cross. And don't stay there. Place it and walk away from it. Give it to him. Ask him to take it. It may not be instantaneously, but he will. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this day. Pray this all in the only way we know how. The name of your precious son, Jesus Christ.